Let me finish by going through the legacy of communism in Eastern Europe. Take a look at those buildings. Those buildings are on the outskirts of one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic. Those buildings are anything but beautiful though. On the city and the urban landscape, Soviet architecture was about providing massive apartment blocks for what they called the workers. Everyone was going to live at the same level, lower middle class, upper poverty. But since everybody lived the same, everybody had the exact same kind of apartment, which was overwhelmingly gray behemoths of apartment blocks, no one would notice that and everybody would be fine with it. It would be perfect equality. After the collapse of communism, these monsters remain. In many countries, they're referred to as panelocks. And most East European cities are ringed by them. In fact, even inside of some of the older parts of these beautiful East European cities, where architecture had gotten old rather than fix the architecture up that was two, three, four hundred years old, the communists would tear it down and you would have a beautiful central square with all of these old, gorgeous buildings and then this sore thumb sticking out on one part of the square because they replaced it with this utilitarian socialist realism architecture. This is what Prague looks like. Come on, it's a beautiful urban landscape. That church up there is in Prague Castle. This is Chesky Krumlov in the southern part of the Czech Republic. Beautiful, it's a UNESCO site. Oh, but look in the background. There they are. The uglification of the landscape. This is part of the legacy of communism throughout Eastern Europe. Another legacy is this. In the rural landscape, there's a lack of quality transportation. That leads to internal isolation. What you're looking at there literally is a highway. And that is not uncommon. So ask yourself, why is it that the communist would not have built quality road systems? And of course the answer is they didn't want people moving around. They liked it when they knew where people were at because that way they could keep track of them. Well, the legacy is that much of Eastern Europe remains with these very small roads. It can be very charming, but movement is exceptionally slow in most places. And then there's the legacy on the population. Most of the people who remember it, who lived through it, are scarred by the threat of regression, going backwards towards that system, and the oppression that came from it. Remember, many people who live in Eastern Europe today spent some time in jails or prisons simply because they expressed an opinion. Then there's other people, especially older people, who might view that era as the good old days. And then younger people, people who were born after 1989 or don't remember it, they don't grasp the trauma that their parents and grandparents went through, like the proverbial knock at the door. Do you know what that is? That happened in the middle of the night, maybe at your Panelock apartment, where here comes this knock. Everybody knows who that is. That's the secret police. Don't bother going out the back door. They're there too. And off you go. No one in the apartment complex, nobody in the town asks any questions and a new family gets moved in. And where you went is anybody's guess. What you did is anybody's guess. That's the way the system was run. There's a distinct split in the population today on the view of the Russians and Vladimir Putin. Of course, at first, with the collapse of communism, everybody ran from the Russians. But now, as I said, there's a certain good old days view amongst some people. 
And because Putin likes to flex his muscles, some people really like that show of strength. I'll tell you a couple of things that some friends of mine who are from Eastern Europe have told me they said or were told to them. I have a friend from Poland. He's told me many times when he was going to school in Poland, he came home one time after he first started taking Russian in school, which was a mandatory language. He came home with an A in Russian. His dad slapped him around and said, you get a C in Russian and never anything more than a C. If you bring home anything more than a C, you'll get a beating for that. Another friend of mine likes to say, everywhere the Russians step, the grass doesn't grow for a decade. So it's clear that everyone does not like the Russians and Russian influence. At the same time, you see Putin motorcycle clubs riding around there with big pictures of Vladimir Putin on their leather jackets or on their t-shirts. Since the collapse of communism, here's what's happened economically. Communism in Eastern Europe was based overwhelmingly on heavy industry. But once communism collapsed, those heavy industrial factories mostly collapsed with it. Not all of it, but mostly. In Eastern Europe, believe it or not, they still make automobiles. Škoda is made by the Czechs. Dacia is made by the Romanians. These are fairly popular cars in Europe. You don't see them many other places in the world, but they're fairly popular cars in Europe. Mostly they're kind of a low-end automobile. Consulting has become a big business. Obviously, very few people from the West speak the languages of Eastern Europe. And if you're going to do business there, somebody has to navigate the systems. The gas pipelines that come from Russia into Western Europe flow through Eastern Europe. It's been consultants who have managed to make the deals that allow that gas to flow into Western Europe. Many of the countries are heavily agricultural dependent. Alcohol, like vodka, beer, and wine, is produced and sold abroad. And of course, tourism plays an important role in many places, especially Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, Croatia, and Poland. 